there he is, the stand-up staple, our superstar, our favorite doctor. I have a lot of other things to say about him, but let's get to it. You don't want to hear from me. Hello, Aaron Carroll. How are you? I am really excited because you're here and it's been too long and I have a million questions. How are good. you? I'm doing good. Doing well. Are you excited about this uh, upcoming presidential election and all the health care issues that are going to be discussed? <laughs> I don't know if excited is the right word. I also, I mean, you think there's going to be a lot of health care issues discussed? I mean, I hope there are, but no, God, it just feels like it's going to be noise. Kind of where I wanted to start with you. I know there's a big announcement today that, you know, this is really PR uh, as a way to talk about something that they actually got done uh, under the Inflation Reduction Act to reduce or create competition with with drugs. But it wouldn't be happening for a year at the soonest. But Biden's going to come out and and, and uh, talk about it today because he has to they have to get this done. I didn't explain it very well. But the question to you is you and I used to talk about the country debated health care reform for a few years. Obama passed. It was challenged in courts. It was upheld for the most part. And then I still always feel like we don't talk about it that much anymore, except in healthcare circles. What do you think? What is your perception of how the, the issue gets attention or not? I mean, I, I get totally demoralized because it feels like every time we have a presidential election, if there's a Democratic primary, we have an argument about single payer versus status quo. Um, but if there's not, then we don't have much of a debate at all. Uh, because there's, you know, pushing some incremental reform uh, through probably the Biden administration, or I don't know what uh, the Republican health care proposal is. Uh, you know, how many times did President Trump tell us he was going to unveil it any minute now? Um, and he was there in office for four years. I'm still not seeing anything else, nor am I seeing health care be a major component of any other Republican candidates running. I mean, if I'm wrong, let me know. I just haven't seen anything yet that would convince me that Healthcare is going to be a real staple of this election. Our healthcare system is still so broken. There's so many reforms that need to be made, totally. but, but yet it doesn't get discussed as much. And I wonder why it did get discussed. Is it because president Obama put it on the agenda? Is it because of what helped him get elected? I mean, you think about all these other issues that, that get headlines as they should women's reproductive rights. You know, women are concerned about that each and every day at gun, Man. gun violence. It's headlines all the time. And so we talk about a lot of these, you know, legal cases and so on. But why isn't healthcare, health insurance, seen as that we all have to deal with these high prices and all these issues around all of it, and just trying to be able to afford it, get it top of mind? Do you think? I think people get tired. I, I mean, I think I think first President Obama took a big hit politically pushing through the Affordable Care Act. I mean, mm -hmm. you got to remember there were like sixty a filibuster-proof Senate, and then. You know, they lost that 60th vote and they had to go through reconciliation. I mean, that was a once in a lifetime Senate. Uh, it's not going to be seen again. Um, and the House is right now tenuously held um, <coughs> by the Republicans. I don't see them advancing anything major. Nothing can get past the House and the Senate. I don't see President Biden making this you know, something he's going to stand on because it would be very hard to get major legislation through. And no one wants to really die on that hill. I also think that, you know, there are a lot of Democrats that were like, oh, affordable care got passed. We're good. Right. Um, no. Uh, you know, we still have a ridiculously expensive health care system where access measured by so many metrics is still a problem and quality is still an issue. But we can't we can't even get past the health care financing discussion, let alone talking about delivery system reforms or any of the stuff that really is much more impactful on healthcare. So yeah, it, it's, it's demoralizing. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm look, I'm glad they're trying to talk about pharmaceutical reform and how might we more rationally talk about drug pricing. It's good, but it's going to get fought in the courts and it's going to take a big hit and who knows how that will wind up. And it's important to remember at the end of the day that, for all the bluster, pharmaceutical spending is you know, not the biggest component of healthcare spending. Even if we uh, reduce that, it would bring he overall healthcare spending down, but not like people think. I mean, what is it? Maybe, maybe total 10% of all healthcare spending. Uh, mm -hmm. And so if we reduce that by 
a couple percentage points, that's not a major change when amortized over the entire population. My understanding. I don't, minimize, I don't want to minimize how much that might mean to people taking the individual drugs that they're talking about negotiating, right. but who knows? Uh, my understanding is that these uh, drug price competition, they're going to name 10 drugs, apparently, which is yeah. interesting. We'll see who they name, uh, but that it mostly will benefit people 65 and older that are already on Medicare. Well, it's, it's Medicare. So it's yeah. like, yeah, of course it's going to, it's, it's, a, it's only for Medicare. It's it not allows a- Medicare to negotiate with drug makers, something that you yes. long argued, a lot of yeah. people long argued. Oh, I, but it's like, but this is where, yes, as a major component of healthcare reform, it is a way to, to help tackle healthcare spending. But the problem is that we, we do these things one at a time and we spend years getting to them. And at the end, then everybody gets upset because it doesn't make as much of a difference as um, it's also because we try, we demonize sectors of the healthcare system almost in a cycle. Who's to blame? Yeah. It's pharmaceutical companies. Nope, it's insurance companies. Nope, it's doctors. Nope, it's nurses. Nope, it's the hospitals. Nope, it's the hospital systems. I, it's employers. It's a, it's everybody. But we only ever like focus our attention sort of one at a time, give it a shot. And if we fail, we move on to the next demon when really everyone's to blame and we need to probably tackle this holistically. The only way that this can happen is because Medicare has leverage because they have so many patients, they have so many actual customers buying these drugs so they can, they can force them to negotiate or else the farms, the drug companies can say, well, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to deal with you. They could do that, but they wouldn't do that. And so they're saying in other countries get to negotiate, the VA gets to negotiate. Uh, but what the pharmaceutical companies opposition to this, I guess the lobbyists are saying, well, if you do this, it's going to make it harder for us to invest in research to develop these great new drugs. Any truth to their argument? Well, first of all, let's let's own that, you know, health insurance companies right now are totally able to negotiate for drug company rebates, and they do. I mean, this is why your insurance comes with a formulary, like that, because they have made particular deals with certain drug companies for reduced prices. This happens every day. Healthcare spending is still a lot, you know, granted, it would be nice to add Medicare to the roles, but it is not as if, you know, most people in the United States have private insurance. Lots of those are actually in probably insurance that's made negotiations in some way, either like directly or through a middleman to, to negotiate their rebates on some different pharmaceuticals. Like I said, it's nice to add this to the roles, but the idea that this is going to solve everything is somewhat laughable. Right. Now, granted, the pharmaceutical companies are going to take a direct hit, probably on the order of you know, millions to billions of dollars. That's a lot of money to them. So they're going to fight it tooth and nail. Um, now, they're also arguing about investment and incentives. Here, here's the problem. We have a system right now which is based on the idea that we, we get the money for pharmaceutical innovation by charging sick people as much as possible for their care. That doesn't make a lot of sense. If we want to take money and be a public money, which is really what Medicare is, and try to incentivize drug companies to do a better job, I got no problem with that. During the COVID pandemic, we did not raise everyone's healthcare money so that we could get massively innovative vaccines, which were freaking miracles. No, they just spent a lot of money through a lot of different pathways to incentivize companies to really invest in this kind in this area. And companies did, and they made a lot of money, and it was great for everybody. We could do similar things, but right now we're trying to argue that the best way to incentivize innovation is to make sick people pay as much as possible for the care they desperately need, regardless of how much money they make. And even if it's up for a disease that has nothing related to the innovation, that doesn't seem like the most efficient and thoughtful way to do, right, so right. do a better job. Uh Let's talk about vaccines for a minute. You mentioned it. You've got a new video over at your hit YouTube channel, Healthcare Triage, about RFK. No. And it's just kind of funny because most of us have no idea when he's making an argument what he's talking about, or anybody when they're talking about these vaccines, or you know, some nutrition benefits. Every you know, the millions of podcasts, and everybody's an expert on food and exercise now. And they're all experts to me. I mean, they all sound like they're making sense. RFK sounds like he's making some good arguments. I just know he's not. Uh, And your latest video just takes one argument that he made and lays bare how ridiculous and immoral the argument is about why 
they don't test these vaccines against a placebo was the main like argument. But it was such an important one that it almost felt like you don't I don't at, at that point. I already knew he's wrong, but I don't need to take on the rest of his arguments. What, what would you say about the kind of ways these guys are arguing and how convincing they tend to be until held up against just a little bit of scrutiny like you at healthcare triage or anywhere else that knows their stuff? I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, they're not trying, I don't think they're trying to convince. I think they're trying to win. Um, and they're, it's, they're not trying know, to convince, they're trying to what? I lost you. Win. Like, you know, this is like, oh, let's win a debate. And they can do that through like flashbangs and smoke and mirrors. Yeah, right. And, oh, we can say like, okay, great. You know, they're on a, you know, it's, a, it's sound bites. And of course the problem with, you know, the, the way to counteract that is with long form crime. Like I can take a five or six minute video and lay bare you know what the problem is, but that is not how we digest news. So, in other words, if we digest news, it'd be like a bunch of people on a panel. Everybody gets asked a question. God knows if you're going to get a good question. You have like one 30 second piece to answer. It's going to be sound bite, sound bite, sound bite. You're a liar, sound bite, and it's over. And everybody goes, "What just happened?" We don't. We don't like have thought. This is not how it used to be. Um, you know, you would. You would. Lots of times, like debates were carried out even through like written documents where, like, you know, you really tried to get at the issues. It's how people argue in court. It's how lots of stuff happens. But they're just winning a soundbite war. And he's got a couple sound bites which sound good. Right. We dismantled with thoughtful conversation, but that's not how it's done. And if it is, then what happens is somebody like that moves on to the next opportunity and real and ramps up the exact same argument, which has just been discredited. But you also have to remember that, you know, like right, right periodically for the New York Times, if I'm lucky, a couple million people will read what I wrote, which sounds like a lot. But that means a couple hundred million people did not. <laughs> and so, you know, you just can't reach everybody. And so, you know, someone like that who's willing to go on new show after new show after new show is going to reach a whole lot of people. Um, and they're very good at, you know, the sound bites or, or the arguments and it can be really damaging, but it's really hard to put out those fires. State of COVID, state of the flu in America. I mean, COVID is, is on the rise. Uh, you know, we're seeing more cases. We're seeing more hospitalizations and ER visits. There's no question we're seeing a bump, but I still think it's also important to, you know, put things in perspective. It's nowhere near it was a year ago or more. Uh, it, you know, there's still a, a ton more immunity out there. We're not seeing any major variants, which causes pause to think like, okay, the stuff we've got isn't working. I imagine there'll be a new set of boosters in the fall, likely tailored to more recent variants. I will encourage everyone to go get them. Mm -hmm. I expect a dwindling percentage of the population to listen. Uh, and this will eventually go the way of bad flu, where you know, every year we beg people to get a flu shot. I have to go through the motions of listening to people make the same tired arguments about how the shot doesn't work or flu isn't that big a deal. And, you know, it's not going to hurt me. So why should I care? We've now moved. It feels like we're moving more and more with COVID to that. It's demoralizing. It's it's a sad statement on uh, how America treats chronic illness and you know illnesses that are a risk to immunocompromised and elderly people. But as you know, as I've written about before, it's like COVID didn't cause this. It just exposed it. We had this with flu. We had this with lots of other diseases. It feels like COVID is headed in that direction as well. Uh, when you say it's demoralizing, mm -hmm. do you generally mean because more people don't get vaccinated? If that were the case, we would be far better off because we come up with these miracle vaccines and not enough people take them. Is that the demoralizing part? Well, or is part, there Part of it is the vaccination. Part of it is that people will not stay home when they're sick. Part of this is we won't take, we won't create a work environment where we encourage people to stay home when they're sick. Same goes for school. But, you know, we make it hard for people in jobs to stay home when they're sick. People who have something to do that they want to do are unlikely to skip it, including vacation, if they get sick. Because, you know, everybody starts to get into like, I want mine or, you know, me, me, me. Yeah. And, and let, taking care of these diseases is a community effort. And that's how we prevent spread. When we took COVID really seriously, we made real efforts not to spread it as much as possible. That also mattered. Uh, those days are long over.
But, you know, we were never there with flu. I can't tell you, you know, how many years would I be like at work and someone would come to my office like hacking up a lung and I'd be like, why are you here? Um, and either, you know, some American got to go to work or can do. But it's like that that not only is bad for health, it's actually bad for the economy. But, you know, it's only so many times I don't want to be like so pessimistic, but like these arguments have been around for a long time. We seem just as unwilling to listen to them today as we were in the past. And that's sad. To be fair, that was when you managed the Denny's. Ah, I wish that sounds like a great job. I mean, the truth is like in a, at a workplace, like if you're talking about Indiana university, it wouldn't be weird or inappropriate for you to tell someone, Hey, listen, don't come in. Cause you get paid sick days, but at a Denny's that's where they do come in. And that's yes. what's proportionally affected because they're living closer to the edge. When you and have a limited sick. amount of PTO and this is even at good jobs and right. you don't want to blow it. And it's like, it's PTO, whether it's sick or not sick. Right. You don't want to blow it on sick. You want to take it for vacation uh, or for us others. Right? I mean, and lots of jobs limit paid time off. And so, you know, you get COVID. That's a minimum five days. Uh, if you're following CDC guidelines, sometimes more. You get COVID again. Now you've taken off like two weeks of your PTO and you're like, screw that. I'm going. And then you get the flu. Are you really going to stay home? Like we don't we don't set this up. With, with paid sick leave in a way that, that incentivizes good for the economy and good for health. Uh, let's go through a couple of the other greatest hits that I certainly want to get your take on. You're kind of there in Ground Zero, Indiana University, or in the state of Indiana, I should say. Uh, and I wanted to ask you about the state of women's reproductive rights. Uh, you work, you have some great colleagues there. Uh, Dr. Tracy Wilkerson, right, is there, um, yeah. who... What, wrote a whole piece in the New York times uh, about how terrible this has been uh, specifically for a young girl, I guess from Indiana, uh, rather uh, was it Ohio that came to, had to come to Indiana to get an abortion. Where, how are we like, what's happening now that so many of these States have changed their laws for women? What, what, what kind of, uh, what are you seeing? Are you, it's not, it, good. it's not good for health. It's not good for, you know, family planning. It's not, I just, it's terrible. Um, not to mention the fact that when people get scared and skittish about providing health care, it puts people's health at risk. Um, yeah. it, I, it's hard. I, I will admit, like, I'm not on the front lines of this issue, uh, but what I do see is uh, it's not good for the economy. It's not good for trying to attract workers. Um, it doesn't necessarily, you know, make it easier to retain and recruit. Uh, and it, makes it harder to, 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 to assure women that they can get the health care they need when they need it. Um, and especially because so many of these laws are so restrictive uh, that it scares, it scares providers and it scares hospitals. But that's, I think, part of the goal is to make it so that people really are skittish about providing this type of health care. And you're actually seeing, though, you're seeing the data of providers being scared to offer treatment, much less even sometimes stay open at certain points. It's places. hard. I, I want to hesitate to say we're seeing the data because it's like I see anecdotes. Right. That's what I'm wondering. I see a yeah, lot. Of I see horror stories, but it's like it's not as if there's an accumulated database of this and that you can just point to and be like, yeah, proven. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it takes the problem is it takes time to you know, accumulate data and then look at outcomes and then, you know, watch it over time. You, know, you can't, you can't like enact a law and be like, I've proven how it works right now. There are always unintended consequences, things that go on. It's very expensive to do research. And a lot of the states where this is happening are not really terribly interested in investing in the research that, that uncovers. It. So it's a hard problem. Uh, I didn't even really quite think about, about that. Yeah. Obviously it's, so it, it, it leaves it up to journalists who also aren't probably equipped, funded, uh, and, and there was a, I wrote a piece, I want to say like last, the end of last year, which is about like, there was that whole, like, you know, lots, some blue States are trying to prevent like researchers from traveling to red States to do research. Cause they think that's a good way to punish the red States. But I'm like, you know what, how, how do these blue state researchers that are interested and in, say, how does an abortion law affect it? If you then stop them from traveling to blue States or spending money to do research in blue States, do you think the red states are going to be doing that? Like it's so everyone, everyone wants to win. They want to win political points. They want to like hurt someone else. Uh, and there are just so many ways in that unintended consequences occur. Um, it's, it's a, it's a hard time. Uh, 
the Republican debate last week without Donald Trump, not, a, I don't think there was a mention of health care. I don't think, I mean, I didn't watch it. Uh, can't it's weird that you didn't watch it because you texted me. I love this Vivek Ramaswamy. Why, why are you such a fan? I think we were like, we were moving and we were like neck deep and like unpacking something. But no, I did <laughs> not do that. And I'm, I can't, I gotta be honest, I didn't even watch the debate. But no, I didn't see anything that followed that made me think there was a robust and interesting intellectual debate on healthcare. <laughs> there was not. Uh, going back to healthcare triage, you recently have taken on what artificial sweeteners for the 5,000. This is a, you should just have a show about artificial sweeteners. There's new research. I think that I saw getting some attention about artificial sweeteners, which, you know, just said more of the same, that they're somehow dangerous. You are not buying it. And I can say I've been to your home. It, it was filled with diet soda. You are practicing what you preach. You're not afraid. You've got one there. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, this is actually what a diet on a Palmer, but it's like, no, I mean, again, it's like if you're one, there's not really good conclusive evidence that artificial sweeteners are damaging. Um, and even if you believed that there was a link, it has to be so small, it's barely measurable. And the reality is that more often than not, it's a it's a debate between sugar or artificial sweeteners. And there's no question every single time I would choose the diet drink over the sugar drink. Um, now people were like, oh, you need neither? I'm like, oh, okay, uh, good luck with that. Uh, you know, abstinence rarely works. Telling people to eliminate all sweeteners from their life is very difficult. And if, again, if I'm trying to do harm reduction, uh, I would rather people use the, the artificial sweeteners than 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 than, than, than sugar. Um, and even, I mean, even when you looked at that study, the amount of artificial sweetener that you needed, even like in the European studies, to achieve what they said was dangerous was like half a case of soda a day. If you're drinking half a case of soda, diet soda a day, not only is it not proven and not only is that the level at which they start to get concerned, I'll say that's probably a lot. That's a lot. Don't. But the vast majority of us are not drinking that much diet soda a day and in the amount that most of us are consuming it there's there's just nothing going on what is your consumption of caffeine caffeine or, or artificial sweetener? i want to say caffeine actually because i actually i just i made an assumption that was my my bad that i drink diet soda generally i drink diet coke because it has caffeine in it uh so i'll drink coffee in the morning i don't drink it every day obviously a, a diet coke i, I drink a co i drink coffee every morning yeah no one to two cups, something like that. Um, I drink, really the only soda I drink these days is if, you know, uh, Amy or Sydney like stop and get McDonald's right. diet soda yeah. on the way home because right. that is the best diet. Um, but like, that's it. And so, and maybe I have tea once in a while at night. Like, so it's not an enormous amount of caffeine, but it's also not an enormous amount of artificial sweetener. Like I'm not consuming that much. Like, so I, I this, and I think that that's like a lot of people. You know, people are not consuming half a case of diet soda. If they are, I concur. That's probably too much, even if uh, it's not proven. I have to ask you about how much attention you've paid. And I should have looked this up if you've done a lot on this recently or, or at all. I feel like everywhere I look, we're hearing about the benefits of hallucinogens. I don't understand. I haven't taken many deep dives you know, I want to try some mushrooms, but I mean, I've heard so many people kept talking about unlocking trauma and the health benefits and it's not for everybody. And this is a thoughtful conversation. Michael Pollan is very respected, yeah. wrote a book about it and, and really kind of put it on the map. This guy, Tim Ferriss, funds research into it. He's a huge influential guy. I wonder how much you you think about it or think that um, it maybe it's over overly played up too much these days. Well, I mean, there's been, there have been some interesting studies. I know I've done a healthcare chairs on this. I know I wrote a times column on this. I can't remember how really? many years ago um, on uh, psychedelics for, uh, for a variety of mental health disorders. The research is interesting, but it's all small. Like they don't have a lot of really well-designed long-term randomized controlled trials. So it's the kind of thing where I'm like, looks interesting. Let's do more research. Here it is. Um, 2017 New York Times. Can psychedelics be therapy? Allow research to find out. This is, I, this is one of those. I'm like, it's not terribly new. Like people have been saying this for since then, at least, because that was when I wrote the column. But 
the research is interesting and I don't discount it. Like I think it actually might. The problem is that it's like those studies are incredibly rigorous regimented protocols. And of course, most people are getting high on their own. Um, and so that's not A equals B. Uh, it's, it's, those, are, those are just very, very different in how they're being used. But this is one of those where we medicalize things that are illegal. We did it you know, back during prohibition with alcohol. Uh, we've done it quite a bit with marijuana. Now that marijuana is becoming more and more legal, you see less and less focus on medical marijuana um, because people just use it. I expect that we will see medical psychedelics someday if they legalize them, maybe we won't. I, I don't know, but I don't discount it out of hand. There is some, there is some impressive research, especially on you know, intractable problems that have failed to be settled by uh, other pharmaceutical or, or therapy. And like that stuff holds promise. I, I'm all for well-designed controlled research that looks at both safety and efficacy. But a lot of the people that are promoting it have gone up sort of outside the boundaries of that science. And that's always a little bit squishy. And so I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Needs, needs more research. Yeah. And let's do it. Like, I'm not saying don't do it. I wish we could yeah. be better at doing this kind of work. We make it very hard. Uh, I wanted to ask you also about your friend, well, Indiana and, and book bands. And this has been your friend, John Green's big thing for, I don't know, over the, over a month now, uh, because they banned his book in his hometown library or something like that. You are friends with them. He produces your YouTube show. Uh, what, what's the going on in your state and with books and his whole mission? I mean, I, I never want to speak for others, but, uh, but we had a county library that, uh, basically took a whole host of young adult books and decided that they were dangerous for youth and that they needed to be, you know, put behind the counter where they'd have to ask for them and then get perhaps parents permission, which is, you know, it's not banning, but it's, it's de facto banning. And it's also labeling a lot of literature dangerous. Um, that just really like, it's just, you know, every time you think we're, we're beyond this or past it, uh, it comes back again. Like, you know, the books, that they're you know, labeling dangerous, including John's. Really? Like, you know, some of these are like, there is sex that happens off screen, you know, like it's not, or off, off, like it's not like we're highlighting it. It's just, you know, it happened. Um, and all of a sudden it's like, okay, now that needs to be taken away from all children. I'm like, then you don't live in the real world. You don't watch TV. You don't watch movies. You don't do like, if you think this is the most dangerous stuff, but it's easy to attack. And it wins political points with, you know, local politicians sometimes, and especially where a lot of these fights have devolved into school boards and libraries. And it's yeah. sad. And we I used to think this kind of stuff was gone. But, you know, sometimes it feels like people lost their minds. Uh, yeah, that feels that way quite often. If you go to a school board meeting, a local school board meeting or or turn on the TV. Uh, well, I'm glad that you haven't. It seems like you still have your marbles. Trying, yeah. you know, keeping up as going as I can. Yeah, well, I'm very happy uh, to talk with you and to hear from you. And uh, everybody's happy to have you back. Oh, this, I was supposed to ask you this one. <laughs> these, are, these are your worst nightmare. Happy National Ice Cream Day. Here are ice cream surprising health benefits according to Harvard. Oh, research. come on. Let me guess the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Uh, let's see. I think that's right. Yeah, because they, they turn out this stuff all. Oh, they do. What are the, what are they? Oh, like, you know, the sugar will kill you. Sugar will save you. Wine will kill you. Wine will save you. You know, don't eat carbs. Eat more carbs. It's like, you know, it's like, okay. Like, I, I you know, every time you turn around, there's another one. But like, you... really, really ice cream benefit. This is one of those where I want to be like, I'm not telling you to ban ice cream. I think ice cream is great. But like, it's not health. It's not, it's not, it's not like, ooh, eat tons. It's healthy. It's going to make you love more and feel good and lose. <laughs> oh, come on. It's ice cream. It's dessert. Uh, all right. I was going to ask you, well, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up there because I don't know if you, you know about, I'm just going to wrap it up there and then I'm going to hit stop and ask you. Uh, thank you very much, as always, my friend, for, uh, for joining us. Appreciate you and all of your insights today. Anytime.